Welcome to a special edition of the Apple Corps. We're here at WWDC 2019 in San Jose, where we just got a ton of new software updates from Apple and that new Mac Pro that Pro users have been waiting for since 2013. Seriously, that was the last time that Apple updated the design for this machine. So today we're gonna go through some of the highlights, some of my favorite features, and through some of the hands-on time that we got with these devices and some of the software features. So let's start with that Mac Pro because it's not always a given that we get products at WWDC and when we do, it's exciting, especially a product like the Mac Pro. And sure, there had been tons of rumors about a Mac Pro coming and Apple had even confirmed that it was going to come in 2019, but hey, we all know what happened to the AirPower mat and it wasn't 100% certain that we were gonna get it at this event, so there was a lot of cheering happening when Tim Cook finally brought it up on stage. This is the new Mac Pro, and it's incredible! Now, first impressions, obviously, is that it looks like a massive cheese grater. There is no denying it, and sure, it may be a throwback to previous models, but this one really leans in to the cheese grater look, and Apple kind of has a history of being inspired by household products like last model's trash can. What did strike me is how much larger it is than last model's Mac Pro. Um, when I saw it up close, and here is my hand for reference, it is a pretty big machine. And hey, rightfully so, because in many ways it's that modular design that people have been requesting and you're going to be able to change up and upgrade components as you go. And let's talk about performance because it's got some impressive specs. At least, you know, it's got the potential to have some impressive specs. The Mac Pro comes with Intel Xeon processor, which starts at 8 cores, but can max out at up to 28 cores, and then it starts with 32 gigabytes of system memory and maxes out at 1.5 terabytes. Now, in theory, because we haven't tested it out, this machine has the capability to play up to three streams of 8K video at once or 12 streams of 4K video. And obviously, with such a powerful machine, you're going to need a monitor that's going to keep up with all that amazing content and let you visualize what you've been working on. And for that, Apple launched its Apple Pro Display XDR, which actually stands for Extreme Dynamic Range. Extreme! And, you know, maybe it is worth the Extreme label. It's a 32-inch monitor, 6K retina display with 20 million pixels. And I got to see it up close and I was impressed at how amazingly bright and amazingly sharp this display looks. It's actually got 1,000 nits of full screen brightness. And then there's the price for these products. And we were not expecting them to be cheap. After all, they are for professional users and not your average consumer. And they are made by Apple. So we were expecting high prices. The Mac Pro starts at $6,000. That's what the basic specs that I mentioned. Whereas the monitor starts at $5,000. But here's the catch. The stand where the monitor sits sold separately and that was probably the one time that people actually kind of booed or sighed at the keynote. The Visa mount adapter will be $199 and the Pro Stand $999. And like the Mac Pro, they'll all be available in the, in the fall. And yeah, you can imagine how expensive this is going to be once it's maxed out in terms of specs. But again, it's not for your average consumer, and I'm not a pro user myself, so I took to Twitter and asked you guys the same thing. And I would say most of you, almost 65% of the people who voted said yes, these were the updates that you were hoping for in the Mac Pro. Absolutely, because as a, a filmmaker myself who uses sometimes 4K footage, my PC sometimes is really slow, so having a Mac Pro is going to just expedite the entire process. And what do you think about the $1,000 stand? <laughs> I think it's kind of ridiculous, but if it protects that monitor, I am willing to dish it out. You're all in then. I'm all in. Now the Mac Pro will literally be rolling out because it has optional wheels later on this year, Apple says in the fall, so expect it in like September or October. So moving on to Mac OS, there's a couple things going on here. Mac OS 10.15, aka K 
Catalina, we now know the name of the Mac operating system. And now a few things to highlight, the first of which had been rumored, which is that Apple broke up the iTunes band, and we now have three separate apps coming from it. So the Apple Music app, we have the TV shows app, and the podcast app. We are getting some iOS features in macOS, like the screen time controls to keep your screen time in check, and also the Find My feature, which is coming to the Macs. And what's cool about it is that you can now find your Mac even if it's offline because it sends out a secure Bluetooth beacon and the whole interaction is encrypted and anonymous. And obviously we've started to see a trend here of iOS apps coming to Mac OS and that's going to continue with Project Catalyst was the other big announcement and probably the biggest one for the actual developers because what it does is that it allows developers to create third-party apps based on existing iPad apps. So it's going to be much easier to code for Mac OS. But don't take my word for it because I'm obviously not a developer. Seeing how they've uh, kind of been building up to be able to do this uh, and, and also all in Swift uh, is super exciting and just kind of a revolutionary thing for us mobile engineers to be able to also, you know, kind of bridge that experience onto the uh, desktop as well. And in case you needed more proof that the iPads and the Macs are going to continue to play nice, Apple also announced Sidecar, which basically allows you to use your iPad as an external monitor for your Mac, including Apple Pencil support. But the biggest iPad news of the entire keynote was iPad OS. The iPad finally comes out of the shadow of iOS and gets its own operating system. A move that's going to make the iPad more computer-like um, in the ways that users want it. So one of these things includes improved multitasking features. So you're now gonna be able to have two tabs of the same app open in one screen. There's also some new gesture controls which will allow you to copy paste a lot easier now. Um, and the three finger undo feature that we had heard about. And my personal favorite is that you're now going to be able to download all your content directly from your other devices um, because now you can plug in an external USB and you'll see it all pop up in the files. That's right, you can now plug in a thumb drive. And files on iPadOS also got a much needed refresh. Moving on to iOS 13, topping the list dark mode. Now this was the worst kept secret because we had even gotten leaks of what dark mode would look like in iOS 13 and they were kind of true to form, uh, at least based on what Craig Federighi showed us up on stage. There was a lot of cheering though. I know a lot of you had been asking for dark mode for a very long time and Apple delivered. Now what they didn't deliver on was a whole interface change which had also been rumored. Individual apps, however, did get somewhat of a refresh, um, particularly the message app, which is where Apple focused a lot of its energy in the keynote. You can now swipe to type like what Google has been doing on Gboard for a very long time. And you'll now have a cute little profile bubble, uh, kind of like WhatsApp, which you can personalize with your own Memoji. And that's the other thing that Apple focused a lot on when talking about messages. So we're going to have a lot of options to customize your Memoji look to your liking, including AirPod earrings and a grill. Also, Memoji stickers are coming to messages. The Mail app got rich font support. The Notes app has a few refreshes as well, and Maps now lets you have favorite locations and has Apple's own version of Google Street View. Now, I was particularly excited with some of the new editing tools in the Photos app. So it now has kind of a different look with a slider where you can edit your uh, photos, but I was particularly impressed with the editing video options because you can now do something that was impossibly hard to do before, which is rotate your videos right within the native app. You can also now edit your videos in terms of sharpness, um, contrast, color saturation, everything that you were able to do with your photos, you can now do to videos. They also added some new uh, portrait lighting features that kind of remind us of beauty mode. But perhaps the biggest redesign came to the health app. It now includes other metrics that you can track, which include hearing health. So it'll factor in um, how loud the ambient noise is and also how loudly you're listening to your music. And you can now also track your period or your menstrual cycle through the health app. 
Now, one of the things we didn't get was more uh, bedtime or sleep features, which had been rumored and which could have been a signal of what's to come in the Apple Watch. But a lot of these health features are also coming to the Apple Watch, and this is where we bridged that gap to watchOS 6, which is our next order of business. So along with those new health tracking features, which are also coming to your wrist, there's also something called activity trends, which is measured by the watch, but actually surfaced on the activities app on your phone. And what it does is that it looks at your last 90 days um, and it tells you the trends uh, that it's observing and then it compares it to the last 365 days. So now if your activity levels have decreased in the last 90 days compared to the last year, it will let you know and will give you tips on how to increase your activity levels or how much you have to increase them by to sustain your average. And I think this is gonna be the first of many coaching capabilities that we're gonna start to see on the Apple Watch. But the biggest news relating to watchOS 6 had to have been the standalone app store that is now coming directly to the Apple Watch so you won't need to download an app first on your iPhone to then see it mirrored on your Apple Watch. This means that developers can also develop apps just for the Apple Watch, giving it more independence from the iPhone. Now, obviously you still need an iPhone to set the Apple Watch up, but it's a step in the right direction. Now, some of the other things that came to the Apple Watch were more watch faces, which are always welcome. Uh, you now have the calculator app and the voice memo app on the Apple Watch. Now, I think one of the underlying themes at WWDC this year was privacy. Apple definitely made it a point to showcase how each and every one of its features and products in terms of the Mac Pro would keep your data safe. And to me, a highlight when it comes to privacy was a new feature called the sign in with Apple option, um, which allows you to sign in with apps without giving them all your personal data. So what it does is create a new randomized email address um, when you first log into an app that basically forwards anything um, that they have to give to you to your email, but the actual app never gets your email, just some random address that Apple has created. Apple also continued to push the envelope on augmented reality at the keynote um, with AR Kit 3. And we saw this amazing Minecraft presentation made possible by two new features. So one is called People Occlusion and the other one is called Motion Tracking, all coming with AR Kit 3. But I think the best person to explain it is the actual developer from Minecraft. People Occlusion allows us to put characters like people in the scene, be part of the Minecraft scene, go life-size, walk around your Minecraft world, interact with it like if you were like in a physical world, but like it's just you, right? And you and many of your friends, everybody sort of seamlessly being part of the Minecraft world. And last, but certainly not least, this was an event for developers. And one of the biggest things to come out of WWDC 2019 was Swift UI. This is a new framework for Apple's programming language that's built in Swift for Swift. What does that mean exactly for developers? Well, we talked to one to find out. Yeah, this is going to save me a ton of time. The, the, the big one up front is just that it's a uh, lot smaller code to write the same thing. Um, they showed on the screen, you know, a, a couple thousand lines that had been reduced to, down to about 10, um, which was an insane improvement. But the second improvement is that it will reduce testing time um, and bug fixing time. That's it for this special edition of the Apple Core, but next week we'll be back at the usual location. So come back and see us at CNET.com and on YouTube.